This is Nanoscape. I'm Seth Zimmerman. And I'm Erin Spain. On this show, we venture into the frontier of nanotechnology. With experts in the field who are turning the science of small into the next industrial revolution. This podcast is brought to you by the International Institute for Nanotechnology at Northwestern University. In a short amount of time, nanotechnology has become one of the most important scientific fields of the 21st century, promising to solve some of our world's most pressing challenges. Northwestern University continues to produce many leading edge discoveries in the field and has become home to some of the most productive nanotechnology researchers in the world. Today, we're going to explore Northwestern's commitment to this multi-billion dollar field with our guest, Dr. Milan Merksic. Dr. Merksich is one of the world's leading engineers working at the interface between materials and biology and a member of the IAN steering committee. He previously served as Northwestern's vice president of research. He is the Henry Wade Rogers Professor of Biomedical Engineering, Professor of Chemistry, Professor of Cell and Developmental Biology. Welcome to the show, Professor. Aaron and Seth, it's great to be with you today and a really exciting topic for us to discuss. I'm looking forward to this. Let's get started. So you are someone who has built an incredible career as a scientist, an entrepreneur, and like many others with a focus in nanotechnology, you chose to make Northwestern your home, your academic home. Tell me about the draw to Northwestern. What brought you here in 2011? And why is this a destination for people making important contributions to nanotechnology research? There really are so many reasons. Northwestern is one of our nations and really one of the world's leading research institutions really just a path breaker in terms of developing new fields of study, new technologies, and being really active in taking those inventions and getting them into the marketplace through commercialization. For me, what the draw for Northwestern was that the community here is extremely collaborative, extremely collegial. What you have at Northwestern are faculty and students working across departments and across schools, coming together in teams to work on the most challenging problems, the types of problems that no one lab can have all of the expertise that's needed to figure something out. And so the culture at Northwestern couldn't be stronger. And it's really something that we're so well known for. And the second thing is really the special position that Northwestern has in nanoscience and nanotechnology. This is an area that 30 years ago was really in its most early stages to the point where we didn't even know how to talk about it. We didn't have the vocabulary yet, but Northwestern was one of the earliest places that started to create a vision, attracted people here, attracted funding here, and started to teach the world how you work at this new scale, this scale where structures are just about big enough that we can see them with incredible tools, small enough that we didn't know how to make them. And so Nano got started with a whole set of advances that gave us the tools to control the structure of matter at that one to hundred nanometer length scale. And then using this incredible knowledge and instrumentation, understand the properties of matter at those scales. And that was the starting point that really has paid dividends in so many different fields, in medicine, in energy, in so many other areas that have an immediate impact in human benefit. So in recent years, you've also done a lot of advocacy and education about the field to those outside of academia, which has to be a challenge. You testified before Congress in 2014 about the importance of nanotechnology funding and research. But how do you explain nanotechnology to people outside of the field? Because you say nano, people probably have some sort of image of what that means. But how do you actually put it in terms that they'll fully comprehend? Yeah, and this is such an important thing. The work that we do gives us a big responsibility because the amount of resources, funding that goes into our work is significant and it's largely provided through tax dollars. And we've got a responsibility to be good stewards with those funds and to help the population, the citizenry, understand what we're doing, why it's important. So for nano, the way to think about it is that when you take all of the materials that we know to work with, whether it's copper or glass or plastics, we know what the properties of those materials are. And if we build a device or an object from those materials, we know what the properties should be. 
What's exciting about nano is that when you reduce the dimension, the size of materials that we know well, when you get down to that nano regime, that under 100 nanometers scale, they actually take on new properties. And so the exciting feature of nano is you can take a, a material like gold metal, and if we cut it in half, the two halves are still gold metal. If we cut each of those pieces in half again, they still look like gold. They've got the conductivity of gold, etc. But when you get down to the nano scale, they actually don't look like gold metal. They have different colors, different conductivities. They interact with light in different ways. And depending on the size, those properties shift. And so what nano has done for us is opened up a whole new world of material properties. And when we understand those properties, when we have the tools to control the length scale and therefore the properties, we've got a whole new toolkit of materials to build devices out of. As you've mentioned, you spoke this way to folks in Congress. You're trying to help them understand that we can use nanotechnology to solve some of these great problems facing the world. Clean water supply, you mentioned renewable energy, efficient cancer treatments, and many others. And something that you talked about, though, is this need for collaboration, to bring folks together from all these different fields. And this is something that Northwestern does really well. Can you talk about, first of all, how difficult that is to break down some of these silos? And how has Northwestern been able to do this. It is difficult. And I think the evidence for that is the realization of how few places do it so well as we do. It's in large part cultural. Being at a university where you don't have different scientists living and working in their buildings and not walking around other buildings where other departments might do their work. I think there are a couple of keys at Northwestern. One, there is a type of Midwestern culture that makes us excited to work with one another and understand that when we put our contributions together, we wind up with something that really is spectacular. And that old adage that you can get a lot more done if you don't mind sharing the credit. That's certainly true here. I think another part of it is that the structure at Northwestern makes it very common for faculty members, professors, to have appointments in multiple departments. I have appointments in the engineering school, the medical school, and arts and sciences. And so we become more connected across the university to the different corners. And then the the third part I would point to is that it's common for our graduate students, those students that have finished college and they're now going into a program to earn their PhD, which is largely research-based. Many of our graduate students are mentored by faculty members in two different departments and schools. And so they serve as really a glue that holds all of us together across these many different dimensions. And so Northwestern has all that. And if you wanted to create it today at a place that hasn't had that culture, it's extremely difficult because it's a different way of doing things, a different way of structuring appointments. Culture is always difficult to change. And, and in this way, I think especially so. But Northwestern has it and it really is to our advantage. Chicago itself has become such a hub for biomedical research and other types of scientific research. Can you talk a little bit about that? I know you're a Chicago person yourself, born and raised here. How does our position being in the Midwest help bolster us? You know, it's interesting. When you look at in the biotech field, certainly, in the origins of biotechnology. The Bay Area and Boston were the two regions where things really started happening first. It gave advantages to being there, and you see the trajectories that those regions were put on. The Midwest has an enormous amount of basic research underway between Northwestern, the University of Chicago, the University of Illinois, and other institutions that perform research. We have a very significant and sizable amount of basic science going on. The challenge is that there's this hump you have to get over. You have to have a critical mass of companies getting started, talent in the industry that's available to be recruited to a new company to be the CEO or the vice president of research and development or whatever the position might be. 
And it's only recently that we've seen the Chicago region turn that corner and you feel it and you see it. You see it in many of the private developments throughout the city and suburbs that provide that lab space that really is what new startups and growing companies need. And one area that I think really cemented our position on the map and now being part of this club of destination regions for biotech is the awarding of the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub to Chicago as vice president for research at Northwestern. That was one of my big priorities, working with our partners, University of Chicago and University of Illinois. And it's an amazing thing. There were over 70 teams across the country. Each team had three universities that competed for one new biohub. These biohubs are funded by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative at uh, a commitment that starts at $250 million and really creates a site that is developing a next revolutionary technology for the life sciences. And the concept that we put together, and we were told the way that the three institutions partnered and worked together in a really effective, natural way, positioned us to, to win that against every other university in the country. To do that, obviously, you need a bit of a, an entrepreneurial spirit to pull this kind of thing off. And you yourself, you're an entrepreneur. Your breakthrough technology, the SAMD technology, has become the leading label-free method in drug discovery. And you spun off that breakthrough into the SAMD tech company. So how important, though, is then that spirit to take it to that next level after your discovery? Got to be a big hurdle for a lot. It is, Seth. It's a hurdle. It's a challenge, but it's an enormously rewarding pursuit. And I'd say a couple of things. If we go back 25 years, many of the universities didn't really know how to support this commercialization phase, something we oftentimes call translation. But they also didn't value it because they felt that it was in conflict with basic science and the pure work of scientists to understand how things work. Uh, that's changed. And uh, now I think there's a broad recognition that great basic science, great advances in our fundamental understanding of nature naturally lead to opportunities to create technologies that benefit society. And universities, as part of their mission, seek to benefit society by educating a population, by serving as really honest brokers in terms of our analysis of problems and policy guidance and in commercializing science for benefits across industries. And the other thing I would say is that the students that are now coming to graduate school and the faculty, a younger generation, which are starting their careers, are incredibly driven by mission of helping the world in some way. And so the translation and commercialization of their findings is important to this whole new generation of researchers and thinkers. And it's one of the factors that I think motivated universities to up their game in terms of supporting and partnering with faculty and students to advance their work in this way. And there's actually degrees you can get now in entrepreneurship. That's a degree that you can focus on. Absolutely. And when you look inside the university, you know, at Northwestern, Francesca Coronel the dean of the Kellogg School of Management, has been an incredible partner with engineering and science and nano specifically to look at ways of enriching the MBA program for students by having opportunities where they can work with the world leading technologists and vice versa. Students uh, pursuing nanoscience have this ability to work with world class business students to put these concepts together. I just want to double check how many companies do you actually own now that you've started up yourself? I founded three companies. One had an IPO four or five years ago and is now on the NASDAQ. That's Lyra Therapeutics, developing stent type materials for nasal cavities to open up inflamed airways and help people breathe. We started Sam. Tech, which you mentioned earlier, Seth, which was a really exciting technology to test compounds at the scale of 100,000 a day to help pharmaceutical companies find starting points for developing drugs. And it's a technology that we refer to as high throughput screening. We built that company over a decade and 
recently sold it to Charles River Laboratories, which is a global contract research organization that provides these tools to the pharma industry broadly. Over 100 companies use it, for example. And we've just recently started a company to develop a new class of protein therapeutics, a company we call Majumab Therapeutics. It's still in the early phase, but we're spending a lot of time on it, and we're really excited about what that future is going to look like. This is a question I love to ask when I'm interviewing folks is, In research and teaching, setbacks can often lead to significant learning opportunities. So can you share a time when a challenge in your work led to an unexpected learning experience or breakthrough? Yeah, it's a good question, Seth, because I think what many people don't really understand about science is that there are a lot of failures in what we do. In fact, it's not uncommon that somebody in the lab might be working for 12 months and have nothing really work. And every few weeks you rethink your idea, you set it up in a slightly different way, you try it again, and it doesn't work. And then you get to that day where it does work, or it might give you a result that you didn't expect, which some might think is a disappointing day. But in fact, those are some of the most exciting days because when you observe something you didn't expect, it means there's something you didn't understand and now you're on the cusp of figuring something new out. And that's the type of moment that drives science, that moves us forward. You know, I mentioned, and you did as well, the Samd Tech company that developed this method for screening drug compounds, candidates, and finding starting points for drug development. That technique involves using lasers to basically hit surfaces that are nanostructured, so surfaces that interact with light in special ways, and lifts molecules off the surface. And as they accelerate down an electric field and hit a detector, the time it takes them to go down that field is a measure of their molecular weight or their size. When we discovered that technique, it was a pure accident. There was an instrument that was available, and one of the students took our nanostructured surfaces and put it in the instrument. Nobody had done that before. Turned it on and took a measurement, and we instantly found that the quality of the data and the information that we got from that experiment was earth-shattering. It just gave us a whole new way of analyzing molecules at surfaces, and it led to this very practical technology. So in science, a good scientist, their mind is ready for the next surprise or the next unexpected result. And and scientists have to have, you know, real staying power and determination because we can go through long stretches where things don't work, but they only have to work once to change the world. And that's another good example of having the latest tools and technology available to students because sometimes they're not afraid to try new things. You're right, Erin. And we try to encourage that risk taking and and really try to encourage a comfort level with not knowing what's going to always happen so that you just go out and try. Now, at Northwestern, we talked earlier about what is it that makes our university such a special place for nanoscience. Part of it is that we have second to none, the best suite of instruments available to the researchers. Some of these instruments literally cost several million dollars. The most powerful electron microscopes that can take pictures of matter at these really small dimensions. And how do we get those? We've got wonderfully supportive donors and their philanthropy helps put us in a position to do the best work. Our government partners, the state of Illinois, has invested substantially in making Northwestern the best place to do this kind of science. Funding agencies and foundations that really provide support for different programs. And so all of this money comes in. And when you look at Northwestern, we in a single year perform over a billion dollars of research. And so there are thousands of graduate students and staff, faculty together to do this. When you look at the most rapidly growing areas, nano for the past two decades has really set the mark for that. The IIN Symposium, which is coming up, is recognized throughout the scientific community as one of the premier events in nanotechnology. Tell me about this year's event, which is going to be held October 10th. What can attendees expect? The 
tradition with the IAN Symposium is now 20 plus years in length. And this is a one day symposium. We have five or six speakers that are the who's who in nanoscience from not just across the US, but internationally. We bring this group in and have a day where each person gives a talk. And the amazing thing, Aaron, is just the engagement that this brings. The IIN Symposium is the largest meeting at Northwestern every year. We have over 500 participants attend this. Now, we've had 700 participants attend and listen to the lectures. We have to do it at a big venue, oftentimes the local hotel, the Orington Hotel, that has a really large space that we have set up. We have just wonderful sponsors, corporate sponsors, members of our advisory boards who really provide us with funds to support this at the level that it's done. We have policymakers that pay attention, business leaders, service providers, and patent attorneys and others who take this chance to spend one day and stay on top of this growing, rapidly growing and extensive field. What I found so fascinating about the symposium is it's a free event. I couldn't believe that when I was told that it was free. So literally everyone under the sun can come. That's And that's incredible. That really opens it up. Anyone interested in nano? And you know, Seth, we have community members who aren't scientists who spend the day with us and we reach out to them. And I think that's wonderful because, you know, universities are in communities and the university in the best case is a part of that community, having these opportunities and ways that, you know, people who are just interested in what's happening are welcomed in, can be exposed to something, see what's going on here. I think it's so important across the board. As we look forward in the next five to 10 years, what do you see as the most promising emerging trends in nanotech and nanomedicine? Certainly in nanomedicine, we've seen so many successes of nanoparticles having properties that are enabling in medicine, but we're still, and we know this, at the early stages. One of the, I think, really beautiful examples are the spherical nucleic acids that Professor Chad Merkin and his team have developed. A new form of DNA, one of the most common molecules in medicine, but when you package it around nanoparticles, it takes on new properties. And one of the most exciting is that these nanoparticles are able to cross biological barriers in ways that normal proteins and DNA and small molecules can't, whether it's their ability to get into a cell so they can actually get to the proteins that are responsible for a disease and modulate them in a way that restores health or cross what we call the blood-brain barrier. One of the really bad cancer diagnoses to receive is glioblastoma, GBM. And it's nasty in part because drugs that could actually act on that cancer, if you take them, they don't get into the brain. They don't cross this barrier. And we now know that the spherical nucleic acids do cross that blood-brain barrier and they can carry drugs into the brain. The first clinical trial that Northwestern ever did of a technology that was developed at Northwestern, we do lots of clinical trials, but the first one where the clinical trial was a treatment that was developed here were Professor Merkin's SNAs for glioblastoma. And those studies show that the particles got into the brain after they're administered in IV. And it showed that the compositions could actually arrest growth and give some remission of the tumor. Now, this has still got a number of steps to go through, but it just shows you how these technologies really can change the world. Such an incredible example of work being done here at Northwestern. So as we wrap up here today, do you have any parting words for listeners about the future of nanotechnology here at Northwestern and around the world? One thing that makes me so proud is when people in our community, not in our scientific community, but our community, get a better appreciation for what research is, how it works, and how it leads to those developments and solutions that benefit them and their family members and friends. At Northwestern, we really do want 
our nanotech and nanoscience story to be an accessible one. If you visit the IIN's webpage, you can find lots of materials at a layperson level that give examples of what we're working on. See how we celebrate the successes of many of our community members here and the work that they do coming to the IIN symposium and just feeling the energy in the room when we're learning about something new and we're hearing it oftentimes for the first time. To really have this appreciation that science is hard, it's complicated. Sometimes you need to have a lot of math or other preparation to really understand the details, but you can understand a lot of what's going on by just spending some time and going through these resources and appreciate that scientists are normal people. The set of problems that they get excited by are in labs and they've got a lot of expensive equipment around them, et cetera. But these are people whose passion is in their research. And one way I like to explain it to people, I'm amazed when I'm with somebody who's a real sports enthusiast and can tell me who won the World Series in every year and what the score was and who did what in terms of hitting. I could never remember that, but I can remember all of the inventions and papers that led up to some big deal in nanoscience. And it's not because one's different than the other. They are in an obvious way. It's just what captures your interests. And for scientists, it's exploring nature and the world around us. Well, you gave us a really incredible insight today into Northwestern's commitment into the field and what we can expect. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Look, it's been a lot of fun. It just is a privilege for us to be able to work in this setting with the people we work with and the challenging projects that we're engaged in. And thanks for letting us talk about it for a broader audience. Thanks so much for listening. This podcast is brought to you by the International Institute for Nanotechnology at Northwestern University. Be sure to follow this show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. And be sure to give us a five-star review. For more information about IIN, go to our website, iinano.org slash podcast.